we are ready. God is good. Thank God for a hill called Calvary. Thank God for that old rugged cross where Jesus came to bleed, suffer, and die. Where me and you should have went, but instead he went for us. We praise his holy name today. Colossians chapter number one. I am so excited to dive back into the wonderful word of God today. Colossians chapter number one. Let's look at verse number three. Colossians chapter number one, verse number three. God's word says this. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, for we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you have already heard in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has in all the world, and brings forth fruit, as it has also in you since the day you heard it, and knew the grace of God and truth. And you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ for you, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Paul here is writing by divine inspiration on how to get this young church centered. Remember we talked about last week me riding into town with Owen and Evan. They're learning to drive and how sometimes we get on the rumble strips. Sometimes we surpass the rumble strip. Sometimes it's the opposite direction. And we go over into the other lane. What causes us to swerve out of our lane? It could be oncoming traffic. It could be another driver up ahead of us. Maybe who is through on their brakes. And we have no idea what's going on. And there comes a sudden stop. There comes a sudden drift or a sudden swerve. Could be a deer, a dog, a cat, a llama, a peacock. Uh, we live in the south. It could be anything, right? How many of you ever hit a deer? Oh, man. All right, now how many of you have ever had a deer hit you? Yes, 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 yes. And sometimes I can sit in a tree stand and look through my scope and I see not the buck that I'm interested in. But he finds me, right? We don't like it that way. But sometimes that happens. Sometimes it's an Amish buggy. Sometimes it's a kid on a bicycle, right? I mean, you have to be alert all of the time. Sometimes it's not external. <laughs> Sometimes the problem's on the inside of the vehicle. Sometimes it's an internal problem. Have you ever heard of this little device called a cell phone? Yeah, man. Now, I don't know about you, and I'm telling on myself today, you all pray for your preacher, but sometimes i got a burrito in my left hand, and I'm sending emails with my cell phone in my right hand, and I'm driving with my knee, all the while I am talking to somebody on my speakerphone. Don't do that, Reggie. All right? It's not safe. So when we glance down at our phone to respond to a text while we're driving and we're traveling 60 miles per hour, do you know that in that length of time, just to look down a few seconds, we've traveled the length of a football field with our eyes off the road. Wow. So sometimes we swerve. Sometimes we cause our own uncenderness. Have you ever felt out of balance? Have you ever felt uncentered? Have you ever felt like your life is an F5 tornado? We go through trials and tribulations and obstacles and roadblocks and speed bumps. Well, yes, so did these people too. And Paul says the solution is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He doesn't try to counter the culture. He just preaches Jesus. He doesn't even try to really correct the false doctrine by letting them know what it is. Isn't that what we do today? Well, let's, let's give a course on what's wrong. No, let's just focus on Jesus because He is right. For all the cares of this life, for all of the cultural imbalances, for all the wrongs in the world, we concentrate, we focus on Jesus. 
Now you've got to remember, the Apostle Paul is not riding from a beach resort. All right? He is riding from a Roman jail cell. And today we are reading about his prayer. He begins this letter by praying. He is praying in the Spirit, but he is also writing in the Spirit to the people in Colossae. And while he's praying, he expounds on what this young church needs. Some awesome theological principles and truths he lays out here in his prayer. And what he's doing is he's praying the promises of God through Jesus. Isn't it a wonderful thing that we have the ability to pray? The shortest distance between two points is not a straight line, it's prayer. My greatest weaknesses and my greatest strengths, my greatest successes and my greatest failures have had very little to do with me and a lot about prayer. I'm so thankful that we had the opportunity to boldly approach the throne of grace. And so today, I'm preaching a message simply entitled, Prayerful Promises to Center His Church. Prayerful Promises to Center His Church. You say, Brother Reggie, I've never been here before. This is my first Sunday. Well, I promise you, if you've not got a little out of kilter, maybe felt a little unbalanced in your life, maybe felt a little alone in your life, or maybe faced a circumstance where you did not know what to do, you will, friend. <laughs> and so we need this book. We need Paul's instruction. But we've got to remember today, this instruction is a prayer. Now, if you noticed, verses 3 through 8 is a section in your Bible heading. That's why... Or that's because, I should say, it's really one sentence in Greek. It's a run-on sentence. How many teachers we got in here? Yeah, I know we do. Paul is writing by divine inspiration a run-on sentence. I'm just leaving it right there. Leaving it right there. It's almost like Paul's like, Epaphras, I know there's trouble in Colossae. I know that you need me to write. And I'm going to do it. So, here goes. One sentence, and we have six verses. Wow. The first thing that I want us to concentrate on today is four attributes of a centered church. So I, I wrestled all this week. Should I make this about the individual, or should I make this about the community? Should I make this more about moms, dads, husbands, wives, Kiddos, or should I make this collectively about us? Well, you've got to remember that Paul is writing to a church. But guess what a church is comprised of? It's comprised of individuals. And so we can use this message, we can apply this message to us as a community of believers, as a local New Testament church, but we can also apply these truths, these wonderful principles individually to our life. And can I say that as a church, we're made up of individuals that's much, much bigger than the individual, and collectively we are God's body upon this earth. What a blessing that is. And I don't know about you, but me, individually, I don't want to be a, le a weak link in the chain of his body. I, I don't want to be a diseased gallbladder. Right? I, I don't want to be an organ that's not working very well. I want to function by walking in the Spirit of God. Why? Because that's what God requires of me. I can do that through the power of the cross because of the gospel and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But also, it affects you. It affects us all. And so notice as he talks about these four attributes of a center church. Number one, I want you to notice there's an internal faith. An internal faith. He starts off praying. And then he talks about the faith that we have in Christ Jesus in verse number four. Not just any kind of faith. Not just faith in faith. Sometimes you hear people say, well, just have faith. Well, that's good. But faith in who? Faith in Jesus. 
The person of our faith is so important, ladies and gentlemen. It's not about how much faith we have as opposed to who are we placing our faith in. You can have all the faith in the world in me and I promise I'm going to let you down because I'm just a dude. So don't put your faith in me. Don't, don't put your faith in, in, in the family. Put your faith in Jesus. Do you realize that's what it takes to save you, to deliver you, to set you free, to emancipate you? It takes faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes, He's talking about confidence, trust. He's talking about faith. Faith in His Son. Faith in the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Faith in Jesus. How does this come about? Well, I want you to notice they were exposed to a great gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of Jesus. His death, His burial, His resurrection. We put faith in what Jesus has done. In what Jesus has accomplished. We don't try to work out our salvation upon this earth by doing good deeds and abstaining from bad deeds. No, no, no. We place our faith in His finished work. And that's the power of the gospel. Man, I'm telling you, they were exposed to a great gospel. It's the greatest news they'd ever heard. No doubt Epaphras was over in Ephesus and he heard Paul preach the gospel. And he couldn't wait to get back to Colossae and tell his loved ones and tell his friends that guess what? Jesus is the Messiah and he died, but he's not dead anymore. He is alive. What a blessing. What a blessing. They were exposed to a great gospel, but then they experienced a great Christ. And I'm glad to know that Jesus is not somewhere far off from us. That biblical Christianity is a relationship. Do you know today I am experiencing Christ? The same Christ that was born of a virgin. The same Christ that, that restored hearing to those deaf ears. The same Christ that gave sight back to the blinded eye. The same Christ that stood at the mouth of the tomb of Lazarus and cried out, Come forward. The same Christ that carried his cross down the bloody Via Della Rosa and willingly stretched forth his hands and feet and let them crucify him. That's the Christ that I experience today. I'm not talking about a code of conduct. I'm not talking about a set of tenets. I'm just not talking about the Word. I'm talking about Christ living in me, the hope of glory. I walk with Him. I talk with Him. I fellowship with Him. I commune with Him. He is my Jesus. And not only is He present, He's in me. That's why Christianity is different than any religion in the world. It's a relationship. It is experiencing the fullness and the richness and the deepness and the love and the compassion of Christ Himself. They had an internal faith. Do you have an internal faith? If you don't, you're never going to be centered. You can't get sinned. As a matter of fact, you're going to be through off kilter for the rest of your life. But that internal faith is the foundational block in getting you centered. I want you to notice, secondly, they had an eternal hope. An eternal hope. I love what verse number 5 says. It says that we have hope laid up for us in heaven. <laughs> Man, I just don't have hope on this earth that Jesus Christ is coming back. I have hope already laid up for me, in store for me. You say, Brother Reggie, why is that important? Because sometimes my hope runs out down here because I get uncentered. I get imbalanced. I get my eyes off Jesus. But guess what? I can get my eyes back on Jesus. He can recenter me, refocus me, revive me, renew me, and give me hope, hope, hope that He never runs out of supply of. What a blessing. What a blessing. Let's just go back and look at verse number 5 again. Man, I love it. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you've already heard in the word of the truth of the gospel. 
The gospel brings forth good news. We trust the gospel. We exercise faith in the gospel. And then the benefit of that, the fruit of that, is we have hope. We're so nervous, y'all. You all know I'm a UFC fan, okay? I, I am. I'm a UFC fan. My dad used to call me. He'd say, Reg, the fights are on. I'd be like, Dad, it's 1 o'clock on a Tuesday. No, the fights ain't on. Those things take place on a Saturday night late. About 10 o'clock at night is when the prelims start, right? Well, prelims start about 6 or 7. The, the, you get to the main card at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night normally. And sometimes they alter it. But I'd say, Dad, I, that's probably the old fights. Oh, okay. Sometimes I go over to his house and he said, look, Reg, the fights are on. He'd be nervous. Ooh, is he going to get out of that arm bar? Man, he's got that guillotine sunk in so, so deep and tight. And I said, Dad, he wins in the next round. This is an old fight. He'd be a nervous wreck. I said, Dad, just calm down. This guy, he catches him with a good combination. Right? He knocks him out. He wins the fight either by submission or by knockout or they go to decision. But this guy right here wins. He's nervous. That's the way we act. Like we don't know who's won the war. Like we don't know who's already won the fight. Can I tell you my hope is in Jesus and he's already won. Why are we so nervous? Why do we freak out? It's so easy for us to get uncentered and to be unbalanced when Jesus is on the throne and he's in control. An internal faith leads to an eternal hope. I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm expecting a great future. It's going to get better and better and better and better. Far better than this right here. Far better than the nasty now and now and the mundane life that we live. Can I tell you, one of these days, our faith is going to be our sight. And we are going to be with Jesus. I have the hope of that. I have the promise of that. What a blessing that is. So there is internal faith. There is eternal hope. But then there's also external external love. What does the gospel produce besides hope? It produces love. Verse number four, he says that he has a love for all the saints. Verse number eight says your love in the spirit. So I am so thankful, ladies and gentlemen, that we can exhibit a great love. How does everyone know we're his disciples? It's the way we dress. It's the music we listen to. No. Well, it's the things we don't do. No. It's about the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Do you know what 99% of your relational troubles are? It boils down to a matter of love. I've been doing a little conflict resolution this week. <laughs> and I asked a question. It was a very pointed question. It's a very personal question. And I said, how come you can't just let this go? I just can't. Why are you so mad at this individual? They've done me wrong. Do you really love them? I... I Yeah, in Christ. <laughs> That's the cop out, right? Listen. We get offended so easily. And sometimes we need to look at the offense in the light of love. Now, I'm not saying you can't be offended if you love somebody, right? Because I love my wife and sometimes she offends me. Right? And sometimes I offend her. But it don't stay that way. It can be fixed. It can be repaired. Why? Because of this wonderful thing we have called love. It is love. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the heartbeat of the gospel. It's the heartbeat of the gospel. We exhibit a great love. Here's the thing that challenges my heart so much. Here's the thing I love about this. I told you last week, Paul did not go to Colossae. He didn't plant this church. 
But he loved Epaphras. He loved the believers in Colossae. You know why? Because of the same Jesus. Because of the gospel. Because he had already heard the testimony of what God was doing there. There is an internal faith. There is an eternal hope. There is an external love. But there's also an external labor. Man, and this is where we get to engage in the business of God. I want you to notice this. He says the gospel has come to you, spread through all the world, and that it does what? It brings forth fruit. <laughs> I don't bring forth fruit. I can't bring forth fruit. As a matter of fact, God's got it set up where no flesh shall ever glory in His presence. But the Spirit of God, who lives on the inside of me, He is who bears fruit in my life if I'm willing to yield, be filled, and walk in the Spirit and not make provision to the flesh. These things that I'm talking about today, you know what? They are fruit of the Spirit. How do you manifest more fruit? Is it a Bible study on fruit? Is it reading a book about the fruit of the Spirit? It's yielding to the Spirit. All of those things are good. Let's study. Let's read. Let's dive in. Let's line upon line, precept upon precept, rightly divide the word of truth. But we'll never bear fruit unless we're walking in the Spirit. You know, when I begin to walk in the flesh, I get unbalanced. <laughs> When I begin to walk in the flesh, when I begin to make provision for the flesh, I notice that I'm not as productive as I once was. You know why? Because there's some things I need to take care of between me and the Lord. There's some repentance that needs to take place. God loves us enough to where He will press His hand upon us. He will even chasten us if need be. But we don't have to go that far. Why? Because conviction should bring us to a place of repentance. Now, Brother Reggie, why are you saying all of that? We're talking about manifesting fruit. We're talking about a labor. I cannot do what God has called me to do, even though I'm a saved individual in the power of my own flesh. It has to be done by the Lord through me, according to the Spirit of God. Why do we pray? Why do we seek God's will? Why do we armor up? Why don't we just wake up and roll out of the bed and face our day? Because if we do, we're going to get unbalanced. We're going to be uncentered. And it's going to affect not only us, but everybody around us. We're going to hear those rumble strips. And we could very well run off the road. My, my, my. Man. I want to be a centered individual. I want to go to a centered church. I want you to notice this. I want you to notice the four functions of a centered church. I want to go through these quickly. Number one, there's gratitude toward our family. Gratitude for each other. We appreciate each other. We are thankful for each other. We love one another. And we don't take this for granted. Do you realize that it took the blood of Jesus, His death on the cross... For us to have a community like this. Time out. I'm not sacrificing my son to hang out with you. He did. We need each other. I need you. You need me. We need others. It's not just here. Could you imagine what would take place in our county if Christians would quit worrying about petty little things and say, let me take you by the hand, brother, and let me take you by the hand, brother, and let's go forward and advance the kingdom, all preaching the gospel in love by the Spirit. Wow. Mm. I appreciate you. I'm thankful for you. My heart overflows for you what Paul says and he don't even know these people but he's thankful for them he appreciates them he has a gratitude toward them 
Sometimes we take it for granted that we can just come and worship freely. That we can have a Bible that we can read. Do you know that we have the Word of God today more freely than any other society that has ever lived? All kinds of translations and versions. We even have software where we can go back and look at original languages. And sometimes we take the Word of God for granted. Sometimes we take a worship for granted. But sometimes, guys, sometimes we take each other for granted. We can't do that if we're going to stay centered. We've got to realize that God has called us here for such a time as this. We need to appreciate our brothers and sisters in Christ because they're the ones that are going to war with us every single solitary day. And then I want you to notice we need to glorify God with that community of faith, with that family. Why? Because of the fruit of the gospel, because of the richness of Christ, because of the love of God, because God has called us together. You know when I am grateful for you and you are grateful for me, we glorify God. What are we here to do? Glorify God. What does God want for me in my marriage? Glory. What does God want for me as a parent? Glory. What does God want for me as a pastor? Glory. What does God want for me as a principal? Glory. What does God want in my private time? Glory. What does God want in my prayer time? Glory. What does God want in my praise? Glory. And listen, if I never glorify Him again, I can't add one more microfiber to His glory because He is God, but yet He lives on the inside of me. He's given His life for me. He rose again for my justification, and that's what He's worthy of. He's worthy of not some glory, not most glory, not even all glory, but maximum, maximum, maximum glory. And then we pray for our family. Verse number 3, he talks about his prayer for Epaphras and for these Christians in Colossae. Guys, listen, I want you to pray in the Spirit. I don't want to major on this. Probably should. Each one of these things could deserve its own sermon. I want you to quit just going through the motion in your prayer life. I want you to get in your prayer closet. And I want you to get still. And I want you to let the Spirit of God. Begin to speak to your heart. About what you need to be praying about. I had a situation this week. That I, I, I love somebody. I want to help somebody. I don't know how to help somebody. And I got away and said. God I don't know what to do. And I've tried. Looking at your word. And I followed biblical principle and pattern. And I have aligned with your word and your doctrine. But it's seemingly not working for this individual. God please show me. Show me. Show me. And I just get real quiet. And then God would lead me. And how I would need to pray for them. And communicate with them. Now if that seems spooky or supernatural to you. That's praying in the spirit. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake. I pray the Lord my soul to take. In Jesus name. Amen. Bless the grub. Right. I, it's got to be more than that y'all. It's a relationship. Remember. I love getting out with my wife. And having intimate communication. Sometimes we'll just go get a big old cup of coffee. And we'll just drive around and talk. Man I enjoy that. You know why? Why? Because she's changing and so am I. And we've got to stay close to one another. And Jesus is never changing. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. But guess what? The more he conforms you to his image. The more you repent. The more you follow the leadership of the spirit. The more you change and listen. You're going to stay close to him through prayer. And I want you to notice this. I want you to notice the encouragement to the family. Verse number 7, he says, Epaphras, beloved fellow servant. Not just a preacher. I don't know if Epaphras was the actual pastor of the church or not. Not sure about that. 
But according to Paul, he was a beloved fellow servant. He was a faithful minister of the gospel. Man, edification and encouragement. That's what you need. That's what I need. That's what we all need. Yes, sometimes we need rebuke. I get that too. That's why God has instructed us to come together as a family. To worship Him in community. So that we could exhort one another. We could encourage one another. We could edify one another. Guys, can I tell you, we're, we're sitting on the couch and... I'm looking at my wife. I'm thinking, I gotta say something, I gotta do something. I know her heart is breaking, my heart is breaking. I wonder if she's feeling that gnaw, that knife, that dagger that just won't go away. God, what can I do? And all of a sudden, here y'all come. And we go outside and we sit down on the porch. And there y'all are. Making a semicircle. All the way around. Worshipping with us. Praying for us. Letting us know that you love us. And that we're not alone. And you're walking with us. Hand in hand, and can I tell you, it's encouraging. Thank you. Thank you for loving us. <laughs> Thank you for bringing us food. I have gained 15 pounds. Man, it's been wonderful. Y'all can cook. I don't see how some of you guys don't weigh much, much more than you do. And we don't have to worry about that. My wife's blood pressure's been through the roof. I mean, medication after medication. So thankful that it's getting regulated. So thankful for the ones that's intervened. That stayed up and done the research. That's loved us enough to say, no, 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 you're not waiting two weeks for an appointment. You come on in here. We're going to get to the bottom of this. And everywhere I look, where Satan has got a discouraging sign. I can't see it because of you. Satan wants to ruin and wreck my life and my family's life and the life of this church. And it seems like he's got his minions stationed everywhere, but I can't see them for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that I can only encourage you. Half as much as you've encouraged me and my wife. Isn't that why we're here? Isn't this thing bigger than any of us? It had been very easy. To get off centered. <laughs> but you're right there. And as I'm heading toward the rumble strips. Bo's like no bro. Boop. Nope. As I'm going toward the center line over here. Somebody else is like no 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 bro. No no no. As I'm wanting to take a big step back. I got somebody back there like an offensive lineman. That's come out of a three point stance. To say no not on my watch brother Reggie. <laughs> Community. Please don't take it for granted. If you need us. When I say us. I'm not talking about Reggie. Ashley. Owen. Evan. The Tipton kiddos. I'm talking about you need us. When I say us. I'm talking about all of us. You need us. We are here. Oh let's get centered today. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. And let's follow him. Stand to your feet. Lord thank you so much. For the day in which you've given us. Thank you for. Allowing us to be here. Lord my heart is overwhelmed. Lord I realize that. It's more than just the word of God. It's more than just the spirit of God. That keeps us centered. Help us not to fumble the ball. 
Help us to love one another, esteem one another, encourage one another, honor one another, pray for one another, love on one another. Why? Because that's the life that we live in community because of the gospel. Lord, I pray today if there's anyone here that needs some encouragement. God, that we'd rally around them. God, I pray today if there's anybody here that's lost. And they don't know Jesus and the power of that gospel. They can become the fruit of that gospel today. Lord, we've seen you save so many people here. We've seen you change lives. We've seen you restore marriages. We've, we've seen demons cast out of people. God, there's nothing you can't do through us, your body. Help us to surrender. Help us to yield. Jesus, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And amen.